Good afternoon, every Good afternoon, everyone. When Mary Beth asked me to select 15 paintings, 15 modern Japanese paintings for this exhibition, I had a very difficult time because the Coles collection includes a great number of wonderful examples of Nihonga, modern Japanese painting in traditional style. For my presentation today, I chose Mount Penlai or Horaisan in Japanese by Kondo Koichiro. And I like to use this painting as a window or a door or to discuss the aspects of modern Japanese painting, which I find exciting and also to introduce more examples from the Coles collection. So when I reference the works from other sources, I will indicate it on the slide. And I deviate um, from the poetic contemplation and I will try to take you on visual journey. This painting, dates from the latter half of the 1920s. And it is one example of how 20th century Japanese artists dealt with a thoroughly traditional subject matter. Mount Horai is an imaginary landscape that derives from Chinese mythology. It's an island said to be located in the East China Sea. Horai is the abode of Taoist immortals in a paradise entirely off limits to the humans. And it's reachable only by magical transportation, such as riding on a crane. And this paradise has been a subject in East Asian art for many centuries. In Japan, Horai was typically portrayed as a brightly colored, cheerful landscape when pine trees thrive and cranes and tortoises may appear. And these are all symbols of long life. And this type of hanging scroll was often displayed in Japanese homes on festive occasions, uh, New Year's Day or someone's uh, birthday celebration. Spring sunrise, sunrise at Penlai by Tanomura Chokunyu, dating to 1881. And this is an artist that was, uh, who was referenced in Paul's discussion. And this is an orthodox representation of this subject. Uh, Chokunyu was a highly respected Kyoto artist who continued the lineage of the literary tradition into the Meiji period. And he portrays the interior of Horaisan as if a literati utopia. A close-up view shows an elaborate architectural compound with multicolored roofs. A friendly conversation is taking place inside the main hall and a young attendant in the courtyard is, I think he's feeding a crane. And magnificent pine trees and blossoming plums surround the architecture. In the upper area of the painting, we find an attractive pavilion, a perfect viewing spot to admire the beauty of nature. And there is another crane approaching uh, often Japanese artists included in their horizon painting the rising sun uh, as one more auspicious symbol, as you see here. So for the 20th century painters, the challenge was to invent a distinctly modern rendition of this time-honored subject. Iryashikai's Horaisan 
is similar in composition to Chokunyu's, but radically different in style. Uh, the painting is datable to 1918, so it's about 40 years after Chokunyu's work. And here, Shikai fills the landscape with stylized mist and clouds, and mountains devoid of texture strokes. The pine trees have streamlined appearance, uh, as if Shikai was aware of Art Deco, and everything is meticulously rendered in vivid color and gold. And here, Shikai even adds very robust looking bamboo to enhance the auspicious message with uh, the traditional shochikubai or pine bamboo plum combination. The central focus of this painting is again this gorgeous palace, but there are no figures, only two cranes. So with um, its unworldly ambience, this is a landscape not for us mere models to enter. In the upper portion, the sun peaks from behind the mountains casting its beautiful glow on the clouds. And Shikai inscribed a poem in archaic Chinese script. Um, I think this is his version of bronze script. Thank you. In harmony with the elegantly whimsical style of painting. Um, amazingly, not much is known about this artist we know that he was from Fukuoka, Kyushu, uh, and he had early training by local literati masters. And later, um, I think he studied a wide variety of paintings on his own, so he was essentially self-taught. But existing works by Shikai demonstrate a wide range of styles and indicate that he was not only a superb painter, but also an accomplished calligrapher and poet. We don't even know the exact year he died. Kyoto artist Hirai Baisen envisioned Mount Horai differently. Baisen represents Horai as an impregnable fortress. It's as if a scene uh, from a fantasy movie. The famous peak emerges from a mysterious darkness and soars upward toward the heaven. The rock formations show dangerously sharp edges. Two cranes are spotted uh, in the middle, those two white spots. And Bison placed a palace near the top of the peak with a roof in this bright um, color of precious jade. And again, the golden sun illuminating the side of the mountain. A much later example by Fusen Tetsu, and this is from the 1950s. This painting is monumental. It's about five feet and six inches in height, so it's taller than, than me. For three years during his 20s, this is before he began training as a painter, Tetsu worked as a fisherman uh, on Izu Oshima, an island southwest of Tokyo. In his late years, he withdrew from the large public exhibitions and kept painting independently in the city of Nara, which is away from uh, the artistic centers, Tokyo and Kyoto. And he idealized his useful life on this remote island and created many versions of this theme. The painting is simply titled Island and Waves, but I believe he represents his own utopia here, or his personal Mount Horai. Uh, 
and we see the ink technique that uh, Professor Shimao discussed earlier here. The genius of this composition is his placement of the island in the upper half of the painting. It gives an illusion as if we were looking at the mountaintop rising out of uh, the sea of clouds. So we return to Koichiro's Horaisan. For this artist, the painting, this particular painting was a vehicle to showcase his expressive brushwork. And although it is entirely monochromatic, the painting makes a very powerful visual impact, uh, just as powerful as a work in bright colors. And he uses the whole range of ink tonality from uh, the darkest concentrated around the palace to the lighter gray scattered toward the perimeter of the painting. His brushwork vocabulary is unconventional, uh, especially as we see around the sun. Uh, the sun is depicted with a single curved stroke against the reserve of the white paper uh, ground. But he layers light washes, broad lines in diluted ink in different shaped strokes to suggest the sunlight radiating in all directions. Some area, some areas are quite abstract, uh, as if an ink play. The 1920s, when Koichiro painted Mount Penlai, was the decade when uh, he achieved recognition as one of the leading exponents of modern ink painting. Kondo Koichiro's evolution as an artist in the early 20th century is emblematic of the dynamic character of the time when the ongoing modernization process brought about all kinds of changes in Japanese society. He was initially trained in the Western style painting, uh, yoga, and this is his self-portrait in the year he graduated from the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. He was a very promising oil painter, earning recognition at the government exhibitions. In 1914, he married and soon began working as an illustrator and a cartoonist to earn steady income. He was prolific. And, and these are, are just a few examples of his work that appeared in the Yomiuri newspaper. Um, he was employed as manga kisha, or cartoon reporter, uh, by the Yomiuri newspaper company in 1915. And besides creating illustrations for magazines and newspapers, Koichiro also published numerous manga books. And one is... Uh, comic version of I Am a Cat. Um, this is 1919, and I found this image on internet. Uh, so this is based on the famous novel written by Natsume Soseki. Uh, the title is above reading from right to left manga, Wagahai wa neko de aru, comic version, I Am a Cat. And that title, again, is repeated vertically on the spine. And this is his name, Koichiro, the three last characters. Uh, I think the Taisho government was lax in the issue of copyrights because there's no mentioning of Natsume Soseki in this comic book. <laughs> a simple drawing in a comical, hyperbole style, it amply demonstrates Koichiro's talent as a cartoonist. So by this time, the late 1910s, 
Koichiro was enjoying a very successful career in this popular field. But around this time, he also began to study Nihonga techniques very seriously using sumi ink and mineral pigments. This is a, a section of a long hand scroll by Koichiro in, from 1918. And here he's exploring the effect of wet brush on paper, applying uh, washes of varied gradation and adding accents of dark ink. A section from another long hand scroll from the same year, and depicting people viewing cherry blossoms on a rainy day. So that pink kind of veil rays cherry blossoms. His application of color washes is rather tentative and awkward, suggesting that this is likely an experimental work. Around this time, when Koichiro made a gradual transition to become a Nihonga painter, Japanese artists were uh, less constrained by the earlier notion of Nihonga and Yoga uh, as two completely separate schools. There were lively exchanges of ideas among the artists transcending Nihonga and Yoga. So this was a very liberal democratic environment which nurtured and encouraged artistic experimentations. Uh, the topic of um, female poets came up in Mary Beth's talk and the 1910s was really the period of women painters in Japan too. This, is, uh, this period saw a surge of young women uh, who pursued professional career as a painter, or career as a professional painter. In early 1922, Koichiro traveled to Europe, and later that year to China. He returned home, affirming and embracing his identity as a Japanese artist and began focusing on ink. Uh, Professor Shimao showed us brushes and ink stones. Koichiro was a stickler about those materials and he collected Chinese ink stones and brushes. In 1923, so this is the year after he made a trip to Europe and China, Koichiro showed in Tokyo a well-known set of six ink hand scrolls, which represented the night scenes of Comrant fishing in a dramatic contrast of dark and light ink. And this ambitious work secured Koichiro's reputation as an ink painter. And I don't have those scrolls to show you, but uh, this small painting is an intimate version of the same theme. His brush style is playful but confident. And with fluid brush strokes, he effectively portrays the active surface of water. And in the figures and birds, there's a touch of humor that recalls his earlier work as an illustrator. Koichiro on the right with his friend Tsuda Seifu, um, from the 1920s. And in my opinion, the 1910s and 1920s, uh, so this is roughly the Taisho era and the transformative years for Koichiro mark a golden period of Japanese modern art. By this time, all the recent Western artistic, artistic trends from the Impressionism to Fauvism and Cubism had been introduced to Japan. So negotiating between the strength of indigenous traditions and the influences from the West 
Japanese artists worked in a wide spectrum of styles and expressions. Uh, this was the period when Japanese art splintered in multiple directions. And let me show you some examples. Uh, some artists readily experimented and incorporated Western painting technique. Uh, this painting of Peony Garden by Murakami Kangaku shows his extensive use of shading in the depiction of the flowers and also uh, of the ground. As if he's painting in oil, the uh, exhibition includes his much later painting, which is very different in style. Nagase Banka completely rejects the traditional landscape and emphatically adopts Western idiom, uh, reminiscent of uh, Cezanne, both in color and feathery brushwork. But remember his painting on silk using traditional mineral pigments. Other artists remain uh, anchored in the established mode and achieve a more subtle expression of modernity. Shimomura Kanzan, known for his mastery of skill in line and color, continues to demonstrate his technical command, but makes a fresh statement through a bold composition. And here's a uh, detail to show you Kazan's exquisite rendering of orchid. Kikuchi Keigetsu works in the Bijinga genre, the idealized representation of beautiful women. And this tradition goes back to the 17th century. He gives this figure a sense of volume and three-dimensionality, uh, reflecting his understanding of body underneath kimono. So by this time, art schools in Japan offered life drawing classes with the use of uh, nude models. Artists expanded subject matters to include contemporary situations and events. A cafe waitress and her uh, customer, or perhaps a friend, a uh, European style cafe, which became very popular during the 1910s, epitomized modern life. And typically a waitress wore a long white uh, Western style apron over a kimono as shown by this figure and embodied a fashionable urban lifestyle. Uh, this is a quickly and probably spontaneously done painting, a collaborative work of three artists who were uh, regarded to represent the rebellious or radical faction of uh, the Kyoto art world. Uh, those three artists, I think it was in 1913, they set up a tent in a park and opened their a private exhibition in defiance of the government, uh, national government exhibitions, I think right across the street. Terasaki Kogyo portrays a woman in an intimate setting in a very disciplined, naturalistic style. Uh, and Kogyo was known for his uh, rather conservative representation of women, but he deviates here from his usual approach. Uh, practically in her undergarment, the woman casually sits um, in her room and knits clothes for her tiny doll. I'll show you a detail. So here's a doll here. So her facial expression and cryptic theme imbue this figure with uh, psychological ambiguity. Tsujikako presents a popular 
a traditional theme of enjoying a cool breeze on the Kamo River, or Kamo River Bank in Kyoto. And he includes children dressed in Western clothes uh, to signal that this is a current contemporary scene. But the most daring aspect of this painting is his manipulation of space. He, his careful construction of the terrace uh, that extends over the river suggests uh, special depth. But the, that sense of space is, is negated by his treatment of the background, river and river beach, as if a, a flat curtain. So he's creating an interesting tension because one of the figures in the back holds a binocular as if looking into a deep space, which is completely shut off. I'll show you this uh, little figure. In general, the palette brightens up during this time, and some artists used color for an expressive goal. Kawabata Ryushi represents the site in Kyoto where the mansion of Ono no Komachi, a famous uh, 9th century poet, once existed. And the place is today full of bamboo groves, I understand. And Ryushi applies the vivid azurite blue uh, to the bamboo to evoke a sense of mystery uh, or a dreamlike quality and solicits contemplation on the historical uh, past associated with this site. And other painters reduced um, traditional reliance on line and combined simplified forms and decorative use of color for a striking visual effect. So these paintings drawn from the Cole's collection uh, give up just a glimpse into the burst of creative energy that gripped the early 20th century Japanese art world. One movement that appeared during Taisho, uh, which was particularly pertinent to Koichiro and others working ink, was new appreciation of literati painting tradition. The modern concept of uh, subjectivity and individualism that came to uh, Japan with the art of uh, post-impressionist painters such as Van Gogh and Gauguin, and that spurred the Japanese artists to examine and re-evaluate their own literary principle of self-expression in the individualized brush style of earlier literary masters. And this is when the artists noticed Tomioka Tessai. By the mid 1910s, Tessai had been painting over half a century, insisting that he was a scholar and not a painter. And he was uh, essentially self-taught, studying a whole array of past painting styles, both in Japan and China, and even uh, copying some Western style painting. And during the mid 1910s, so this is when Tessai is in his 80s, he begins to reach the height of his creative power. His paintings featured a lavish use of ink, vibrant brushwork, and dramatic composition, sometimes with accents of vivid color. We saw uh, one example in Paul's representation. Modernity of Tessai's art and his independent uh, stance inspired 
and influenced the young generation of artists, including Kondo Koichiro. In Koichiro's case, lack of training in the traditional ink technique freed him from preconceived ideas and allowed him to widely experiment and cultivate a novel, original ink painting. And the 1920s was the period when Koichiro's brush style was at the height of expressionistic freedom. Uh, and I should be concluding my presentation here, but I have an addendum. I'd like to show you one more work by Koichiro, a very recent addition to uh, the Kohl's collection. In 1921, Koichiro traveled on Tokaido with 17 other artists, all members of Tokyo Manga Associ Association. So Koichiro was still active in that field. And here's a group photo with uh, Koichiro. He is uh, the figure on the right in the first row. So 18 artists traveled all the entire uh, Tokaido, uh, mostly, I think, riding in a car and sometimes walking. And based on their tri trip, uh, they produced collaborative work, comic version of the 53 stations of the Tokaido in a hand scroll format. It was an up updated version of the famous Tokaido series by the ukiyo-e master Hiroshige. Altogether, they made 150 sets for fund run, fundraising purposes uh, to, promote, to promote the association, also to promote uh, the comic illustrations as valid art form. And I've seen one set in, uh, in a private collection in Seattle, and it is just delightful. Now, the scrolls that came to the Coles collection represent an ambitious version by Koichiro deriving from the same trip. The work is dated 1921. And each scroll, and each scroll is about six meters in length, so that's 20 feet. Um, each scroll depicts 11 scenes, totaling 55, 53 stations, plus uh, Nihonbashi, the beginning of the Tokaido, and Sanjo Bridge in Kyoto, the end of the Tokaido. So Koichiro represents each location with a new theme based on his first-hand observation of the current uh, condition uh, and state of those old road stations. So here we see a man on a bicycle with a beautiful green and blue background of forest in Akasaka. In some images, Koichiro's brushwork is, is exuberant, as in this scene of uh, entertainers in Hodogaya. In many, Koichiro showcases pure brilliance of Nihonga color, uh, or Yamatoe color, and this is malachite green pulverized mineral pigment in this uh, landscape of Kambara. At times, his color becomes expressionistic. And here, and the colors overwhelm a uh, figure who is right here. Let's see. Oh. Uh, let's see. Oh, and some sections are entirely done in, let's see ink, 
as in the street scene of Chiryu. And here we see a modern horse-drawn cart. And there are images which suggest Koichiro's earlier training in Western uh, painting, ex exemplified in this representation of Mount Fuji, viewed from Yoshiwara. Some images display Koichiro's lyrical approach, uh, and this is Shinagawa Bay, and also in this evocative night scene in Numazu. And I can go, and go on and on, and I'd love to show all 55. <laughs> but uh, these hand scrolls uh, demonstrate Koichiro's impressive range in style and technique. Uh, farmer and his ox in the field of Seki. Uh, travelers eating famous rice cakes, ubagamochi in Kusatsu. In the mountain near Otsu, uh, this is the last hurdle before you reach Kyoto. So he brings together all his resources as an artist, his discipline as a Western-style painter, his facile drawing as an illustrator, and his newly acquired skill in ink and color. Uh, today, Koichiro is recognized above all for his accomplishment in ink painting, and rightly so. After the 1920s, he continued to work in ink, gradually adopting a more objective approach based on Western perspective and uh, Western pictorial space. But he was also a magnificent colorist, as we have seen in the Tokaido hand scrolls. Many artists in any given period work in diverse styles, but I think the range is much richer and varied for modern Japanese artists such as Koichiro because of the intense multi-layered and multifaceted influences and stimuli. And this makes modern Japanese painting as an exciting field of study. Thank you. Uh, you've alluded uh, to his uh, interest in European art, but yeah. specifically, wasn't he particularly interested in the French Impressionists, and specifically Van Gogh? <laughs> because there are, even though he didn't work in thick paint, he did have a bold hand and use a broad brush, and quite frankly, the last one of the latter pictures of a horse and carriage mm -hmm. re reminds me very much of a painting of, by Van Gogh, an early Van Gogh, that we have in the muse mm -hmm. museum here. Um, could you speak to that? <laughs> yes. Um, when he went to Europe to look at uh, paint European paintings firsthand, he was not very much impressed by the contemporary avant-garde work, rather uh, classical earlier traditions. He liked Goya very much. But I know he was looking at paintings Van Gogh, uh, by Van Gogh, because as you point out, those broad uh, brush strokes, mm -hmm. they appear often in Koichiro's work. And uh, I haven't come across a specific mentioning of Van Gogh uh, by Koichiro, but I think visual evidence is there. I would uh, just like to comment on this person's question because in the current issue of the New York Review of Books, I just happened to read it two days ago by chance, there's an article about Van Gogh's influence from Japanese art. <laughs> and so anyone 
who's interested in that, I would suggest you uh, get the current issue of the New York Review of Books and read that. So, so you're talking about uh, influence of ukiyo-e? On no, the other way around, actually. It's Van oh. Gogh's influence Friends. from the Japanese, but they're both interconnected. So Van Gogh was influenced by Japanese art? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Uh, Van Gogh was looking at uh, many ukiyo-e prints, and there are paintings by Van Gogh which explicitly uh, show the motif and composition from the ukiyo-e prints that he was looking at. There are many prints of, uh, available in France, in Paris at that time. Many ukiyo-e prints came with, uh, for example, ceramics, and they were used to wrap them, I think. Thank you so much, Michio, for this talk, but also for really this entire section of the exhibition, which I think introduces so many artists that are unfamiliar to um, us. They certainly weren't, I mean, my training stopped about 1850. <laughs> um, but um, every one of these paintings has been such a joy to discover. Um, I would love to hear more about the um, 52, 53, 55 stages, <laughs> but I want to come back to um, Koichiro's Panglai painting, um, which I think is uh, perhaps one of the most powerful emotional punches in the entire exhibition. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad that you made the reference to Goya, because I think I thought of the first thing I thought of when I saw it was Toledo. But in any case, the use of that dark, dark, dark black, and yeah. then that orb yes. in the sky that's almost blindingly white. It's, one is so tempted to wonder if for him this um, has some kind of powerful religious meaning. Well, he, you know, when he was uh, working as an oil painter, he was very influenced by Impressionist. So he, uh, his paintings, in oil often uh, show reflection of light on the water. So, and that motif of the sun comes up very often in his ink painting. And I think that relates to his um, very early um, study of effect of light. So there are ink Yes, yes, yes. But it's really fun to see. <laughs> Michio-san, thank you very much. I'm uh, very proud of uh, um, my senpai. Thank you, Tamaki, <laughs> <laughs> my kohai. Um, I have a, it just makes me wonder, I don't know if you can answer or not, but uh, there's a um, Tokyo School of Nihonga and the Kyoto School of Nihonga. And in the Taisho period, do you have some sense of uh, this group of painting looks like uh, Kyoto, and uh, this group of painting looks like Tokyo based on geographical difference or maybe training difference? With some artists, you can, um, because Taisho period uh, in Tokyo, there was Japan Art Institute group, and they had specific stylistic trend, I think, or stylistic bent, and then there was Kokuga Sosaku Kyokai in Kyoto, and they were, I think, in a way, much more influenced by the Western style painting. We saw Nonagase Banka, the stream. So, uh, yes, you can tell to some degree, but then not always, because there was a great exchange of artistic ideas, even between Tokyo and Kyoto. And it was a much more fluid situation than earlier years, I think. They traveled a lot, and they, they knew each other's work. So not always, anyway, by me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Morioka-san. That was very, very interesting. I, just, just by way of a, a, a mutual, I believe a mutual friend of ours, Scott Johnson, had a story about that 53, uh, 53 stations, the Mange Maki. Uh -huh. that was done in the late teens. One, one of the participants was Mai Kawasempang. And in the 19, late 60s or early 70s, Scott went to see his widow 
she was ancient. Uh, and he, because he was trying to find out how many copies, which you have finally answered that question by saying 150 copies were done of the set. Uh, he was trying to find out from her whether she remembered uh, how many copies of that set were done. And she said, well, let's see. How many times did I have to run up and down the stairs <laughs> in order to hang them up on the clothesline to dry? I think there must have been at least 100, she said. Uh. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I just thought it was a fun story about that particular it, it, work. It sure is. 150, it's amazing because they were all hand-painted. And you know each one is different, of course, yes. as you would anticipate. Each one's a little bit different from the other. Right. I, I've seen probably 10 of them through the years. Ah, and, yeah. uh, and they're just all wonderful. They're wonderful very, piece. very wonderful. Yeah. The hand scroll uh, that Terry has uh, it, it comes in two volumes, I believe. Yes, two volumes, right. yes, yes. And Koichiro, uh, I think, has four images, uh -huh. four paintings. Yes, but, yeah. Uh, and you know there was a book for... done on that expedition as well. Excuse me? Yeah, uh, there was a book done on it. Oh. Uh, oh. By Kanao Bunendo, oh, uh, who illustrated know. it with some, some, uh, some woodcuts and things like that. But it was their, it was their Nikki of mm. their trip, and it's really goofy and fun. Right, so, because they must have sketched all the way. Absolutely, they trouble. did, they did, and drank a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and there is, um, and this is something maybe you can tell me, but I think there's a surge of interest in the Tokaido theme during Taisho period. Absolutely. Because uh, I know in 19, uh, I think 17, yes. the first, uh, a long distance marathon relay between yes. Kyoto and Tokyo. Yes. The very first one happens during the Taisho period. Yes. And then a Japan Art Institute group, they traveled uh, all the way. And they, uh, I think as they traveled, they were traveling with a mantra mm -hmm. and they kept making hand scrolls. And mm -hmm. that was also done for a um, fundraising purpose for the Institute. So I. Yeah. It, at almost exactly the time that you're talking about, mm. uh, uh, Sonyu and Kashi, mm. the two artists, uh, one of them was the brother of the uh, uh, Honganji head, mm. uh, did this magnificent series that was the, the shitaie was colotype, uh, but then it was printed with mineral pigments with woodblock over it. Oh. And it's eight scrolls printed. Eight eight scrolls and it's got to be ba, 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 about 250 feet long. <laughs> it's astonishing. So yes, you're absolutely right. At that moment, around 1917 or so, there was yeah, there this was enormous interest. interest in the Tokaido. Yeah, and it's a, a topic for future research. Perhaps. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm taking up too much time. Sorry. Forgive me if you already went into this. I didn't realize your lecture had been moved up, so uh, came in late. But I'm aware of a few print designs for woodblock prints that uh, Guichiro did. Uh, one was for the 1915 magazine, Shinigao, very brief five-issue magazine for the uh, Kabuki Theater. He did one design. Mm -hmm. And then he did a series of designs paired with uh, Pinkabo uh, Sinryu, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, short comical poems that he did illustrations for. There were almost 30 mm. prints, I believe, in that. And that's all I'm aware of. Are you aware of any other designs he did for Woodblock? Um, probably a more, much more than I'm aware of, I think. He, his activity was really wide-ranged during Taisho. Uh, I know he, I think, designed a stage curtain at one point, or, or painted. Uh, early on, um, and there are so many books, not only I Am a Cat, but uh, Botchan, another very famous uh, novel by Soseki, he made a comic version of it too. Uh, so that is a whole separate area for somebody to look into and write about, 